What's up guys, my name is Mike and welcome back to a very special edition of Let's Play Hearts of Iron 4, our Learn About Canada series, where we're going to win World War II as Canada, and I'm going to teach you all about this somewhat forgotten nation when it comes to its battle prowess, because Canadians are just so fucking nice. We're just too nice, too goddamn nice these days, and we've forgotten about our military history, but it's super important. So I left off last episode, we were talking about um, Canada's sort of dual, um, sort of somewhat schizophrenic approach to its war uh, prowess back post-World War I. So, I mean, the media was skewering, was fucking skewering our greatest war general of all time, but at the same time, the media was defending some of our other war heroes. So, interesting. Like I said, this is um, kind of a little bit where some of that, I don't want to say anti-American because it's not anti-American. It's the wrong way of describing it. It's almost somewhat like a inferiority complex when it comes to Canada comparing themselves to the U.S. And as a Canadian, I'm more than happy to admit, yes, we have an inferiority complex when it comes to comparing ourselves to the U.S. And a lot of it started to stem from the post-World War I celebrations. So as an example, for example, um, the magazine, Maclean's, published an article about... Uh, the ace pilots of World War One, the greatest ace pilots of World War One, and their conclusion was there was two. There was the Red Baron, the famous German uh, pilot, and there was um, Eddie Rickenbacker, an American pilot. This pissed people off in Canada to no end for a couple of good reasons. First of all, air combat back then was a fucking gong show. It's not like today with like jet fighters and heat-seeking missiles. You literally had dudes in these like rickety-ass biplanes. If they had a machine gun attached to the plane, they were lucky. Otherwise, they were just shooting at each other with small arms from the cockpit, or just like they'd have a pile of grenades in their lap and they just drop them over the edge on enemy trenches. Like fucking ridiculous, hardcore, steampunk type shit. Yet, because of this, um, again, Canadians were crazy back then. You know, some of the roughest people in the world. Out of the top 10 Allied ace pilots in the war, five of them were Canadian. Half of the top 10 Allied pilots were Canadian. For a nation that was by far one of the smallest population-wise to participate in the war, this was huge. Um, and for you know this magazine, McLean's, to publish this article uh, praising Eddie Rickenbacker, who only had 21 confirmed kills in World War One, great number for sure. But by British ace pilot standards, not even considered to be an ace. Like they had their, pardon me, their metrics for what was considered to be an ace and not, and he was not. I mean, Billy Bishop, the greatest Canadian pilot of all time, had 72 confirmed kills in World War One. Now, granted, he'd entered the war a little earlier than Eddie, but, you know, you take a guy like Donald McLean out of Ottawa, who entered the war the same time as Eddie Rickenbacker, had 42 confirmed kills, twice as much as Eddie Rickenbacker, and yet this magazine's art, this article was like, no, Eddie, Eddie and the Red Baron were the top two pilots of World War One, hands down. Huge, huge, huge outrage. Now, I mean... To their credit, they did publish a sort of semi-retraction later on, but this was this stuck in the craw of a lot of Canadians and really started sort of setting the tone for, you know, the 20th century relations between um, Canada and the U.S., where you know, diplomatically, economically, best of buddies, but culturally. There's always been some friction. That friction has lasted, of course, even until today. So, I mean, I love you guys. <laughs> All of you guys. And I'm sure most Americans love Canadians. But there's always a bit of that dick-waving contest when it comes to certain things. And this is certainly was the beginning of that. Certainly was the beginning of that. So, interesting sort of schizophrenic approach where we're skewering our best general, yet we're praising and defending um, some of our other war heroes. And within the military itself, there was quite a bit of sort of um, stress about what would it mean if Canada were to go against the against were to go to war against the US you know post World War one that was actually the big concern and you might think that's kind of fucking crazy we're allies and whatever else but when you think about it you know we had just somewhat declared independence from the UK you know what would happen if the US decided to invade Canada what would happen if that happened would the would the UK come and rescue us what would what would happen right so the plan was um, designed by a dude, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what his name is. This is the problem when I'm not um, doing any sort of notes ahead of time. Buster Brown, James Buster Brown. He was a, I think a colonel at the time. Um, and he, he was a brilliant colonel, well decorated, not you know what you would normally consider to be a crackpot, but he came up with this plan. Oh, and I have my army experience now. So let's, um, let's delete this division, this, these horses, get rid of the fucking horses. And we'll get rid of the tanks, and we'll add on the infantry, whoops, add on the infantry, so we have a 20 combat width, save that, and then we will start training some new district militia, who we're just going to re rename to infantry. 
So this guy, Buster Brown, um, James Buster Brown, was not a crackpot by any count. He was a decorated colonel, and he was of the opinion that, you know what, the only way that Canada's going to have any chance against the U.S. post-World War I would be simply to invade first. Attack first would be the only way we had a chance. So this is a true story. This is absolutely a true story. What he did is he took five other uh, colonels and generals. I think it was actually colonels. He took five other colonels. They rented a car. They rented a car, went into civilian clothes, and they just took a, like a road trip down to the U.S., snapping pictures, writing notes, talking to people. Not only just looking at things like, oh, you know, roads and bridges and dams, which they certainly did. And they took dozens and dozens of um, photos of those sorts of things. But even talking to the people of these different areas, like, you know, what's the ethnic makeup? Are these guys British? Are they Dutch? You know, where are they from? What's their allegiance to the U.S.? How high is their nationalism? All this crazy shit. And they came up with this like batshit insane plan where Canada would invade the U.S. with cavalry, with um, on, troops on foot. Um, even they'd be sending fucking like dudes on bicycles to capture key, key choke points. So they would invade the U.S., capture key choke points, keep on the U.S. Ameri the, the American Army's flanks, and basically just hold out until either Washington gave up or until the Brits came and rescued us. So sounds fucking crazy now, but the crazier thing was back then, People looked at this plan and thought, you know what, this would actually fucking work. Of course, no longer the case. I mean, the, the, the disparity between the two militaries is just way too wide. But back then, yeah, some dudes on horses and bicycles could have potentially crippled any American advance, like counterattack, into Canada if it ever came to that. So, again, clearly, clearly a bloodthirsty bunch on one side, yet a lot of pacifism on the other side. And a lot of the pacifism came from um, the government, unfortunately. Anschluss of Austria. We should probably at some point now upgrade to a war economy. The world tension has gotten high enough, I think. Let's get um, armament effort. We're going to keep building up our infrastructure. Waiting for the war to start. We got about a year or so away, I think, before the war start starts. So we talked a little bit about the Jack Canuck figure. And one of the big questions whenever I explain someone to somebody about Jack Canuck is where the fuck did this Jack Canuck guy go? How come that's no longer the, the case um, in terms of how people think about Canada? We'll go armor expert, even though we don't have any armor yet. And the real answer is this dude right here. Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King. William Leon Mackenzie King. Um, a tremendous politician, but boring as fuck. He was a terrible speaker. Uh, monotonous. He would drone on and on. Excavation is done. Perfect. Yeah, we definitely need to upgrade our... At least our manpower, because we're already low on um, already low on manpower. Let's see, do we have any doctrine shit available? We will after this one's done. This is done. Um, we'll grab weapons too ahead of time with the bonus. It's fine. So Mackenzie King was incredibly boring, but um, incredibly, incredibly effective as a politician. So we have to understand in Canada and in, in Canadian politics, um, we don't have the same sort of term limits that you have in the U.S. And I'm speaking to the U.S. because I'm assuming most of this audience is American if I go by my metrics. So can uh, Canadian prime ministers don't have term limits and you could serve multiple terms. So you have, especially in this era, you know, early 20th century era, you would have a lot of sort of round robin with politicians where in this case, for example, um, Arthur Megan and, and Mackenzie King kind of went back and forth, back and forth on who was taking prime minister or who is becoming prime minister, um, up until the point that Arthur Megan completely committed career suicide, actually, again, over that um, Chanak crisis we talked about in Turkey, because he was one of the sole voices saying, yeah, let's fucking go to war uh, with on the side of the um, of the UK. And everyone's like, eh, I don't think so. The Canadian population, I mean, was like, I don't fucking think so. And um, from that point on, despite being this towering figure in the conservative movement, Arthur Megan was a towering figure in the conservative movement, was then basically just completely shunned and he was he was a leper from then on when it came to Canadian politics because that's how anti-war a lot of um, a lot of Canada was at that point. So Mackenzie King was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant when it came to be a politician, but absolutely fucking boring when it came to being an inspiring figure. And um, I mean, most people would never know the name Mackenzie King unless you're playing this fucking game, I guess, because he's right here. Handsome fucking devil, though. I will give him that. Looks like a movie star. Um, but but boring as shit. And, you know, part of that reason was because, you know, he was up against the fire. Like, Mackenzie King was a liberal and up against um, fiery conservatives. So, I mean, his main opponent um, post-World War II was a guy by the name of Bennett. So Bennett was a conservative um, running for the conservative party. And after... 
uh, Mackenzie's victory, sort of post World War Two, or part, pardon me, post World War One. Uh, hang on one second here. Uh, we want construction effort. We'll add the civilian. Now we're gonna get equipment effort. We're gonna keep wrapping up our equipment. I think. Low manpower, almost there. It was a dude by the name of Bennett. So post World War One, Mackenzie King won his seats, uh, won the election, won his place. Five years later. Um, when the election came up again, he basically just sat on his ass. He was so confident in his ability and his sort of like political fortitude, he did absolutely nothing to win the election. And in his laziness, out came, hang on, let's go um, limited. Yeah, because limited doesn't give us a penalty yet. So we'll go limited and get 105,000 people. Excellent. He was lazy as fuck. And in his sort of laziness, um, Bennett of the conservatives, what he did is he just fucking worked his ass off. He went from coast to coast. Um, he stumps, he gave stump speeches to every single province, um, coast to coast twice. He just completely out hustled, completely out hustled, uh, encryption. No, we'll get decryption first. He completely out hustled the, the liberals to great effect and barely won the election by one seat. Complete fucking like out of left field underdog victory. Um, which was which was, um, you know, good for the conservatives at the time. However, the year that he won was 1930. Now, there's a conspiracy. With, and, and the significance of 1930, of course, being literally the year the Great Depression started in Canada. Now, the conspiracy theory, although, in my opinion, completely unfounded, was Mackenzie King was such a shrewd dog that he let Bennett win, and that's why he was so lazy, because he, knew, he saw the Great Depression coming and figured if a conservative was in power during the Great Depression, then... You know, they'd be completely destroyed for all future elections. Um, so he just like did nothing, let the conservatives win, let the conservatives take all the blame for the Great Depression, which they did, you know, although it's not really their fault. They did basically take all the blame for how the Great Depression was handled. Um, and then made it a sweeping victory afterwards and then swept into power. So that's what actually happened. But I don't think it was a, a plot by Mackenzie King. I think he was honestly just so fucking lazy and just so arrogant in his ability to you know, to rule, to govern, that he didn't see it coming and just got caught with his pants down because Bennett only won by one seat. So we're getting into the dirty 30s now, which was very similar to how it was handled in the US in terms of, you know, Roosevelt's New Deal. It was actually called the New Deal in Canada as well, but it was handled very, very differently. And let's see, we're gonna get which one? Weapons three or improved infantry equipment two. We'll get weapons three, I suppose, ahead of time bonus. Always a good thing. We got 16 troops. We're gonna try to get up to 24 and have a full-size general go over when the start of the war. That's my plan right now. So the the Great Depression was a huge turning point in terms of both Canadian politics and the Canadian attitude towards its own culture, um, which is really set us up for what was the remainder of the 20th century and really going into the 21st century. But to hear all about that and to hear how Mackenzie King shrewdly won his um, his position back as prime minister right before the Second World War. You're going to have to tune in to next time, to next episode, because I'm going to take a break. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Much love, big kisses, and we'll see you soon.